With another Brexit deadline about to pass and the deal still not done, is democracy in Britain being undermined? That's this week's debate with former UK Minister David Lammy and economist Liam Halligan. And could Brexit bring a return to violence in Northern Ireland? I'll ask a former member of the IRA turned member of the European Parliament. Welcome back to a new season of Upfront. David Lammy and Liam Halligan, thank you both for joining me on Upfront to debate what seems to be the only issue in British politics right now, Brexit. Uh, Liam, I want to start with you. You're a supporter of Brexit. Uh, in terms of where we are this week, another Brexit deadline has come and gone. Another promise has been broken. Prime Minister Boris Johnson said last month that he would rather, quote, be dead in a ditch than ask for another Brexit delay, uh, but he's had to ask for one. So does he have a ditch picked out, do you think? <laughs> yeah, he used some quite colourful language. Uh, I think two important things have changed, uh, Mehdi, and it's nice to be here. What we've seen this week is we've seen the House of Commons finally, <laughs> finally actually pass in principle a piece of legislation allowing through a withdrawal agreement. That's something that he's got in his back pocket. The second thing is that Boris Johnson has been keen to show the electorate leavers and remainers that he's been trying desperately to leave yes. by that um, uh, deadline of the 31st of October, um, Halloween deadline. Um, and it's only uh, in his narrative, the House of Commons, that's stopping him, in particular uh, the opposition parties led by the Labour Party. So in some senses, the, the hijinks, uh, the, the, the game playing is still ongoing and how and I think we're going to see a lot more of but, that. But, but something really important happened this week yes. when we saw the House of Commons as a whole backing a major piece of Brexit legislation. That hasn't happened That's true. since the referendum but Liam, in June 2016. Given all the votes he has lost, given the mess over his illegal suspension of Parliament, given now this latest missed Brexit deadline, what do you say to people who say Boris Johnson should now resign as his two Conservative predecessors, Theresa May and David Cameron, did since Brexit? Well, I think that's what a lot of his political opponents uh, would want. Um, but he is riding pretty high in the opinion polls. He's got a 10, 15, even 20 percentage point lead over his nearest rivals if there is a general election. Uh, that's not to say this is, isn't a divided country. It's absolutely more divided, I think David and I will agree, than in any time during our our lifetimes. We were born in, in, in similar years. Um, but... It has to be said, as the opinion polls show, as he's pushed Parliament okay. more and more, as he's driven this narrative deliberately, it's me versus a Remainer political and media establishment trying to get that Brexit. His popularity has gone up. OK. David Lammy, you've actually called on Boris Johnson to resign. Uh, what do you say to Liam when he says, well, hold on, he's actually doing very well in the polls despite all this chaos? Look... I've been in politics 20 years and I know that polls go up, they come down and different polls tell you different things. And frankly, I'm not interested in a politics that's decided by the polls. This is a very, very worrying prime minister. He's taking quite a lot out of the Trump rule book. He's tearing up our constitutional arrangements, uh, trying to suspend and shut down debate in parliament. And frankly, on any analysis, the decision that lies ahead of Britain is a hugely significant one. Um, Boris Johnson wants to get this all done in a couple of days, basically. He's not taking it seriously. And the reason he's not taking it seriously is because he actually doesn't want the withdrawal bill and the basis on which he wants to leave the European Union properly scrutinised. And I wouldn't if I were him either. But because David, it isn't the problem, frankly, but David, isn't the, the problem, serious though, relationships we've got with the European Union. Isn't the problem, though, that you're obviously staunchly anti-Brexit. You don't want a Brexit of any kind. When you talk about scrutiny and parliamentary procedure and parliamentary sovereignty and the suspension of Parliament. That's all well and good. But most people know deep down what you really want is you don't want Brexit. Why not just own that? Why hide behind all these other things? Why not just say, look, we're trying to stop Brexit by any means possible? Why not just say that? Look, that's a fair point, Mehdi, and I'm very clear. I think the best arrangement 
for this country is to remain within the European Union. But I respect that across my party there's a range of opinion and a range of opinion in the country. What I would say is the best way to bring this country back together is, yes, to allow the deal that Boris Johnson has now struck and this withdrawal agreement that he's put before Parliament, allow the British people to say, do they like it or do they want to remain within the European Union? He won't do that because he's afraid that the British people will say, thank you very much. Now we've seen that you want to dismantle our workers' rights. You want to abandon environmental protections. You want to have the minimal free trade agreement with the European Union, and that would mean tariffs now on our manufacturing, on so many goods uh, and yeah. services. Now we've seen this in detail, and the problems we've got in the island of Ireland, on that basis we want to remain. That's why he doesn't want to do it. And okay. Yeah, I'm clear we should remain within the European Liam. Union, but I want the British people to ultimately make that decision. Liam. And Mehdi, let me just say, okay. if they do decide to stay, I'll go with it. Liam, do you agree with David there that there is a very real risk, even you as a Brexiter must accept, given you look at the polls, it suggests the British public have now changed their mind, they want to stay in the EU, and that's what would happen if you had another referendum, people would change their minds. No, I, I don't think that's right. I, I agree with David, we can take the polls with a pinch of salt, suffice to say that the polls now show a bigger majority of people wanting to leave the European Union than they showed on the eve of the referendum, when of course they voted to leave the European Union. The real issue I have with this, and I do respect where David's coming from, he has been a lot more honest than a lot of other people in his party. He said almost from the outset, uh, a couple of days after the referendum, I seem to think that we needed a second referendum, that he was completely opposed. At least he's been straight. A lot of other people have been hiding behind procedure. I've, I have a major problem, I'm afraid, call me old fashioned, with the idea of not implementing a referendum when Parliament has sanctioned the referendum and given uh, the decision to the British people. Back in early 2016, Parliament voted by six to one to give this decision to the British people. Authority is vested in the people via Parliament, not in Parliament itself. And I think it's a major concern if we don't implement that decision. And an awful lot of people outside the South East, London, the Westminster and the media bubble would be absolutely shocked, indeed around the world, if Britain, the mother of democracies, if you like, on some definitions, didn't actually implement a referendum decision. David, deal with the big picture issue here, which is if you're successful in stopping Brexit, you will have undermined the result of a democratic referendum that you and your party signed up to in 2016. Whatever you think about the rights and wrongs of Brexit, that will have a massive impact on British democracy and faith in British democracy, will it not? Mehdi, no one can tell me a country that has ever undermined democracy with more democracy. That is why you can have a general election and you have another general election in four years' time. And let's be clear, if we did have a second referendum, it would have been in about four years' time. That's the interval of a general election cycle. Let's also be clear, this was a referendum that was meant to be an advisory referendum. That was the basis on which Parliament <laughs> set it up. I give us some advice. What do you think? But it was done no. badly because different parts of the United Kingdom had different views, and we're ignoring currently the views of Scotland and the views of Northern Ireland particularly. And uh, it was also a referendum in which actually, relatively, it was pretty close. Lots of people who voted to leave are now no longer with us. And many young people were disenfranchised. And many Brits who live in the European Union and abroad, who are deeply concerned with our relationship with the European, were not permitted to vote. Uh, and I'm afraid we know now that the Vote Leave campaign broke the law in several okay. places Let and there was a lot of misinformation. Okay. So all, many, many mature democracies like Ireland, like Portugal okay, and others, you made that point. rerun um, referendum campaigns when people get it wrong. Liam, how can it be undemocratic to ask the people to vote again? You're not overruling the people. You're asking them, have you changed your mind? It's three years later. There's been a lot of chaos since. Why not get another opinion? 
Firstly, it was the idea that it was advisory is, is frankly risible, David. The government of the day wrote to every single British household, 27 million households, and said, that this is your decision. That was the basis on which the, Parliament the voted. The fact that the David Cameron I, tore that I, up I, midway I, through is can, not my problem. If, if it's I, his. <laughs> if, I can, if I can speak, if I can speak. So let me finish. Imagine you have a general election and then... Yes, you then have another general election four or five years later. That's because it's a general election. It's not a one-off referendum that's been sanctioned by Parliament. But imagine if you had a general election and then you spent four years not changing the government. You just didn't implement it. That's the danger of not implementing something and then asking people to vote again on Nonsense. the same decision with Remain Absolutely on the ballot nonsense. paper, which, of course, is what David... Once he can say it's nonsense, but it's true. If you put remain on the ballot paper again when that decision has already been made and not implemented, because frankly, a bunch of the media and political elite. But Liam, you're an economist. Liam, you're an economist. Liam, you're an economist. Liam, you're an economist. You know very well. John Maynard Keynes once said, "When the facts change, I change my mind." What do you do, sir? Lots of facts have changed since 2016. Why can't people change their mind? I don't quite get it. The main fact that's changed is that the British economy has carried on pretty well, despite Project Fear by Whitehall and a lot of Westminster saying that the economy would collapse just on the strength of voting for the referendum. What we've really seen, I think, and this is this is sad for me, I must that's say, not true. what we've re what we've really seen is the extent to which a lot of our establishment disdain ordinary voters. You're too thick. You were misled. You've made the wrong decision. We're going to make you vote again until you make okay. the right decision. David, do you want to respond to that? What? An awful lot of people in David's own well, party... Well, I mean, what okay. we've got... Mehdi, can I finish? The, uh, can I, okay, OK, Liam, let David come back in. David, you're, dis you're showing disdain for the electorate. We've got this terrible elite that has gripped the Conservative Party, that has taken them to the hard right, that inflames immigration rhetoric and rhetoric around Muslims, black people, a leader that's been very, very racist and rude. We've also got uh, these public school boys, they've been to Eton and Harrow and very posh schools who now claim to speak on behalf of working class people. I represent a working class area. I don't recognize what I'm hearing. And on the government's own figures, this particular deal that Boris is putting before Parliament would see a drop in GDP of 6.7%. That is not contested, and it is bigger than we saw in the 2008 crash, and they will be doing that to working-class areas. They're not going to suffer. The super-rich will get wealthier, and the middle class will just about survive. But the poorest in our society hold tracks of the north of England. Deprived areas like mine in London will suffer hugely. Okay, Dave, uh, we're running out of time. Before we do, Liam, you've mentioned how divided the country now is. David just mentioned racism and the rise of Islamophobia, racism, other things. Is that something you thought would happen? And is that something you accept is linked to Brexit? Look, I come from a similar part of London as David Lammy. We're from very similar socioeconomic backgrounds. I'm the son of immigrants, too, and we suffer plenty of discrimination uh, in our lifetimes and he knows that because we've known each other for a long time and we do actually quite like each other believe it or not viewers should look at the pew international poll poll ratings of, of of surveys of tolerance across across europe and indeed the world this country has the highest tolerance of immigration and this is a poll just in march 2019 this country is the most welcoming to immigrants than any other member of the eu and it has the highest tolerance towards immigrants. So are you saying there hasn't been a rise in racism since 2016? There are awful people everywhere in this country as everywhere else. And of course, there are some racists in this country, though far, far fewer than Which is not I what I asked, asked, Liam. I'm not denying that. I'm just saying, has there been an increase since 2016? The stat seems to suggest there have been. My own, my own experience is that, and talking to lots of people, is that there hasn't been. I do think, though, there are an awful lot of politicians who are dangerously trying to elide the idea of people voting to want to live in a set in a sovereign independent country with a more direct democracy with uh, division and the outbreak of hostility towards certain ethnic and social groups this is a pretty, pretty tolerant country there's a lot of there's crime here there are big cities of course there is racism 
I think it would be better if we just got on with this and implemented the decision. Just, to, just to be clear, Liam, you can be a tolerant country and still see an increase in racism within a tolerant country. The racially motivated hate crimes compiled by the Home Office show there has been an increase. Uh, David, we're out of time. Last point to you. Do you want to respond in terms of what Britain's become since 2016 and where you place the blame for that? Britain is horribly, horribly divided. There looks like no prospect of us coming together at the moment. Hate crime has gone up by 41 per cent. He's wrong to suggest that the economy is great. It's not great. We've got massive underemployment, particularly in the economy. Lots of community left behind. Austerity was hurting, and things are set to get worse under this deal. So I'm afraid this is a very, very low moment. I've never seen it like this, and I've almost, I'm almost now 50. All of us are extremely worried in our country. Politicians threatened with their lives. I face death threats nearly now on a weekly basis. We lost Joe Cox during the referendum campaign. And we have a prime minister who takes his cue from Steve Bannon. And it's deeply, deeply worrying how they've captured captured the mood here from the from what we're seeing with the Republican Party and they're taking Britain down this down this path and the only person that benefits frankly are the few super rich that will get wealthy because of their sovereign wealth funds okay. and, and their movement of money around the world and very sadly our opponents in countries like Russia who seem to be manipulated much that's going on in our own country David Liam we'll have to leave it there thank you both for joining me on upfront One of the biggest stumbling blocks to Brexit has been the all-important issue of Northern Ireland. 20 years ago, the Good Friday Agreement put an end to decades of sectarian violence there, which killed more than 3,500 people. Today, with Brexit around the corner and fears of a hard UK-Irish border returning to the island of Ireland, that hard-won peace is under threat. Could Brexit really bring about a return of the Northern Irish conflict and maybe even a breakup of the UK? Martina Anderson was a member of the IRA who was freed from prison as a result of the Good Friday Agreement and is now a member of the European Parliament for the Sinn Féin political party. She joins me from Strasbourg. Uh, Martina Anderson, thanks for joining me on Upfront. You're welcome. Your political party, Sinn Féin, played a critical role in the resolution of the Northern Irish conflict. You signed up to the Good Friday Agreement. You supported the laying down of arms on all sides. Um, how worried are you that Brexit, whether a no-deal Brexit or even a Brexit under the terms of this deal proposed by Boris Johnson making its way through Parliament, how worried are you that Brexit could lead to a return of violence in your part of the world? It's important to state at the outset that the war is over. Conflict it's over and the people of Ireland want to continue on on the pathway that we have embarked on 21 years ago. Wars are terrible things and it's how you get out of it, how you build conflict resolution. But there is one thing for sure, that Brexit is totally incompatible with the Good Friday Agreement. And the people of Ireland will not allow the British establishment to have us as collateral damage. But when you say it's totally incompatible with Brexit, is that all forms of Brexit? Is that a no-deal Brexit which brings back a hard border between the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland? Or is it this Boris Johnson Brexit, which Parliament this week voted on, um, which puts the border in the sea and avoids some of the hard border issues, allegedly? Well, there is no good Brexit, but a crash-out Brexit is the worst Brexit of all but what we have been working to ensure that there would never be a return to a harder border in Ireland because the border is already too hard in Ireland. And do you think Petition... that hard border is coming back now? I'm wondering, given this week's events, what do you now think is going to happen? Because on the one hand, you have some hard Brexiters in the UK Parliament saying, actually, we could still get a no-deal Brexit by the end of 2020. And you yourself said back in August uh, to Boris Johnson, when you say you don't want a hard border, we don't believe you. So do you believe him now? Well, it's not about believing Boris Johnson, I can uh, assure you of that. Of course, there could be a crash-out Brexit, and that would be the worst Brexit of all. But that said, uh, where we are at the moment, there was a vote in, uh, in Westminster, and the majority of the MPs in that House of Chaos, formerly known as the House of Commons, actually voted for the EU-British withdrawal from the EU. Now, what they didn't vote for or what they didn't support was the time frame as to how long it would take for that to be concluded. 
So we know for the very first time in that House of Chaos there has been a vote that has supported that deal. So if that deal wants to be implemented then this deal that has been agreed comes in immediately after the transition period and it's just for us to understand and for your listeners okay. to understand the backstop was only going to be applied unless and until it was needed, whereas this deal now comes entry into force immediately after the transition period. So we have gone from something that was somewhat temporary in the backstop to a semi-permanent arrangement. The former chief British negotiator in Northern Ireland, Jonathan Powell, recently wrote, Mr Johnson and Brexit may have done more for a united Ireland than the IRA ever did. Uh, not that many people were talking about Irish reunification back before 2016. Now, post the Brexit referendum, the polls suggest a lot more people are. Could Brexit really provide a backdoor route for getting what you and your party have always wanted, a united Ireland? Well, of course, people in Sinn Féin and within the Republican family who represent now the majority of the people in the north of Ireland have been talking about Irish reunification and someone like myself all of my adult life. That said, Brexit has actually acted as an accelerant to that conversation because people are looking at the Good Friday Agreement and understand the provision in the Good Friday Agreement that we all voted for. Well, I didn't, I was in prison. But people from my tradition voted for it because of the provision in the agreement that stated that the British Secretary of State had the discretion and an obligation to, to bring about a unity referendum in Ireland when it appeared likely that the majority of the people in the north of Ireland yeah. consented to Irish reunification. Now that was a big that was a big strategic swallow for us as Irish Republicans who believe in the sovereignty of the whole of the island. But opinion poll after opinion poll, the last one for instance, Lord Lord Ashcroft yeah. shows that there is a growing majority of people it now doesn't, in it the It doesn't North quite of show a growing majority. The it, shows, it shows fifty one percent of people in Northern Ireland support independence, forty nine support reunification, forty nine percent don't. <laughs> That's within the margin of error. That's basically a statistical tie. Well, of course it's within the margin of error, but as you would know, 52% is dragging the people of Britain out of the EU. And I believe it was like 51% in, uh, in America that got your president elected. So, um, based on statistics, and that's all we can go with no, at my, the my, moment in no, terms no, you, of... It's a fair polls. point you make. 51% is a majority. What I'm saying tested. is, in such, a, in such a tense place, but with tested, a history of violence, tested. with a history of violence, such a tense place where you want consent to make big decisions. You can't blame your unionist opponents like the DUP, the Democratic Unionist Party, for being against this Brexit deal because they still have to represent half or almost half the people in that part of the world who don't want a united Ireland. The DUP do not represent 50% of the people in the north of Ireland. The DUP represent less than 30% of the people in the north of Ireland. So the DUP do not speak for the majority of the people in the north of Ireland. What I'm trying to explain to you at this moment in time, universities, civic society, lawyers and many, many others are involved in a calm and a reasonable conversation about planning and preparing for constitutional change in Ireland. Let me just explain to you that in the north of Ireland and in Ireland, people realise that their EU rights of which they value, their EU citizenship of which they value, and some like myself who critically engage with the EU and know it needs to be reformed. But we know that there is a democratic pathway back into the EU. And let us all recall that on the 29th of April 2017, when Michel Barnier, the chief negotiator, was given his mandate, that the European Council statement of that day said, that in the event of Irish reunification, the whole of Ireland will remain in the EU. Only a few weeks ago, we had President Macron standing beside Boris Johnson, and he said that the solution to the Brexit problem is Irish reunification. But of course, it is up to the people of Ireland. If, as you suggest, the polls are moving in your direction, the Europeans are on board for a unity referendum, and you end up getting a united Ireland off the back of Brexit. Isn't it an irony that you'll have Boris Johnson to thank for that? No, the only people we will have to thank for that are ourselves.
It will be the people of well, Ireland. Hold on. You just said you all voted against decision. Brexit, but Brexit Based might lead to the reunification of preparing. Ireland. As a result of something you voted against, you're going to get something you want. That's an irony, is it not? Irish people in the north of Ireland voted to remain in the EU and under the Good Friday Agreement we have a democratically endorsed pathway back into the EU and we would like the people of America, the people of the world to understand that we are the reasonable people in the room and we're having very good informed conversations about constitutional change in Ireland. Martina Anderson, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you so much for joining me on Upfront. Thank you very much. That's our show. Upfront will be back next week.